Hello again, everyone. Dr. Vincent Lau here on behalf of the Western University Critical Care Program, as well as Dr. Lauren Zarnett from the Neurosurgery Program here at Western, and Dr. Robert Arnfeld also in the Critical Care Program, presenting uh, a new topic of transcranial Doppler for subarachnoid hemorrhage vasospasm, as well as cerebral circulatory arrest uh, and de brain death determination. We'll be going over some cases and then going over the background of transcranial Doppler scanning techniques in the point of care as well as image acquisition interpretation specifically for the vasospasm and cerebral circulatory arrest cases. Just as a quick disclaimer, this is not a replacement for our formal comprehensive TCD study. This is for the point of care only. We will not be teaching on incination through any of the windows for transorbital or transforaminal. Primarily, it'll be just the transtemporal window for the transcranial Doppler, and we'll be only interrogating the MCA or the middle cerebral artery. So getting to case one, it's a 69-year-old female with a sudden onset, worst headache of her life, that was thunderclap. She had a rapid decline in her GCS, which was three on 15, and she was later intubated and transferred from her peripheral hospital for neurosurgical consultation at our institution. On first CT head, the patient had diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage seen here in the sulci in the subarachnoid space, and it's seen also here in the basal cisterns as well as the circle of Willis, indicating diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. Following this, the patient had a CT angiogram, which identified an Akon aneurysm as the culprit, which was GDC coiled and secured times three. On post-admission day number zero, was transferred to the ICU, but the GCS rapidly improved to 15 from three, and the patient was eventually extubated. She was then transferred to the floor on post-admission day number two and transferred to neuroobs under neurosurgery. However, she had decreased level of consciousness on post-admission day number seven, and her GCS was seven and reintubated back in the ICU. A repeat CT head did not show any changes in keeping with a rebleed. And because it was the weekend, a bedside focus was sought after specifically for TCD capabilities and looking for vasospasm. So getting to transcranial Doppler. So much like other point of care modalities, TCD is otherwise a non-invasive ultrasound based modality, uh, which uses color Doppler and spectral Doppler specifically for pulse waves to monitor cerebral artery velocities in the head. The uses are multifaceted. We can look for emboli or thrombosis of various vessels in the brain, stenosis. But specifically in this lecture, we'll be talking about vasospasm post subarachnoid hemorrhage and also for looking for cerebral blood flow and cerebral circulatory rest, a sign of impending brain death. The advantages of transcranial Doppler are much like the point of care. It's non-invasive, it's quickly and easily repeatable, it can be performed at the bedside, and it can be used to monitor spasm post-treatment. The disadvantages are such that the sensitivity is only 80% compared with traditional angiography. However, the sensitivity is 89 to 98% for specifically the MCA, which is the vessel we're most interested in the brain. Other disadvantages are that it's still operator dependent. It's poor for distal vessels, except for the MCA and ICA. There's potential confounders like hypo and hypercapnia, which can affect vessel blood flow, hematocrit in terms of uh, viscosity of the blood, Hypotension can also uh, confound your TCD findings and hypoxia for the same reasons. Edema and vasospasm might be difficult to distinguish post-op, and difficult views are found in some patients as they may have thick skulls specifically for the temporal window. So as we can see here, this is the typical anatomy of a normal circle of Willis, which is a complete ring, which is made up of uh, various vessels in the brain. The circle of Willis is first made up by anterior cerebral arteries, which are seen here, which are connected together by an ACOM or an anterior communicating artery. The internal carotid arteries come up through the neck through the anterior circulation and go through the head and then meet up with the ACA seen here. And also it gives off the MCA seen here. The posterior circulation is primarily provided by two vertebral arteries bilaterally that meet up to the basilar artery and then give off both bilateral PCAs seen here, or posterior cerebral arteries. The anterior and the posterior cerebral circulation are then connected by the PCOM or posterior communicating arteries to complete the circle of Willis. So if we turn our previous diagram counterclockwise 90 degrees, we see here that we still have the circle of Willis, but it's turned on its side, and we have our anterior communicating artery here, our ACOM artery here, we have our PCOM artery connected to our PCAs, but most importantly, we bring out our MCA artery in plane and closer towards us so that we can incidate it more properly. 
So for TCD scanning and techniques, we'll be primarily using the phased array probe, which is 5 megahertz in the cardiac preset. We'll be using both the color as well as the pulse wave spectral Doppler to incinate velocities of the MCA. We'll place it in the transtemporal window seen here, and the index mark should point towards the occiput. So in the transtemporal window, there's various angles and degrees and different parts of the transtemporal window that we can use. The frontal window, the anterior window, the medial, as well as the posterior window through the transtemporal bone. So having a look at a true TCD image in the point of care, we see here the circle of Willis, which is similar to the image that we see here from our diagram. We see bilateral MCAs, and as you notice in systole, the blood would come from the circle of Willis towards the MCA, through the MCA, and therefore would have a red color indicating flow towards the probe. And vice versa, this MCA would have blood flow away, so it would have a blue away color. Also, just for your landmarking, as you can see here behind the circle of Willis would be the bilateral thalami of the brain. So having a look at this clip here, real-time intonation of TCD through the transtemporal window, we see here a red, very brightly colored systolic flow of MCA blood. Just underneath it, we have the circle of Willis, which is intact, just uh, anterior to the bilateral cerebral thalami. And as we can see, we're incinating at about 5 centimeters uh, downwards uh, towards the MCA. And as you can notice, there is aliasing within indicating high flow, uh, which is possibly in keeping with a vasospasm. Typically right now what we would do is we drop a pulse wave Doppler, spectral Doppler straight line down and make sure that we have an equal sign uh, indicating pulse wave and then we would hit Doppler again to interrogate this vessel of the MCA. When we look at normal TCD and Doppler interrogation of the MCA using spectral mode of pulse wave, we see that we would want to move the baseline further down to see things above the baseline, as that would be a flow of the MCA going towards the probe. As we can see here, normal mean velocity is less than 80 centimeters per second with a sharp upstroke of systole and a stepwise decel of diastole. Sharp upstroke as well as stepwise deceleration of diastolic flow. So as we can see here on the sonocyte machine, we interrogate with an equal sign pulse wave Doppler. We would hit Doppler on that uh, MCA and we wait for our entire screen to fill up and then we hit freeze and then we go to our calculations button, select VTI and try to trace the area under the curve. And our V max in the setting is 65 with our V mean or our mean velocity only 43. This would be in keeping with less than 80 centimeters per second, so this would be normal. When we start categorizing vasospasm, however, mild vasospasm is greater than 120 centimeters per second, moderate is greater than 160, and severe vasospasm is greater than 200 centimeters per second. We can also use the Lindegard ratio for vasospasm, which is a ratio of the mean velocity in the MCA compared to the ipsilateral extracranial ICA. High velocities in the MCA greater than 120 centimeters per second might be actually due to hyperemia rather than vasospasm. So the Lindegard ratio allows us to compare MCA to ICA flows. Less than 3 of the Lindegard ratio would be in keeping with hyperemia. Greater than 3 would be vasospasm, where 3 to 6 is mild to moderate, and greater than 6 is severe. So what we're going to be doing is interrogating this vessel as there's aliasing within the MCA. We suspect that there would be high vasospasm within here. So I'll drop our line straight down this MCA as you can see here. And then we'll make sure that we're in pulse wave mode with the equal sign uh, across. And then we'll hit Doppler again to interrogate this vessel. So after we hit Doppler, we'll let the flows go across the screen and we hit freeze when our screen fills up. And as we can see here, where our peak velocities are quite high, even close to the 360 centimeter mark. But that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in our mean velocity. So what we're going to do is use our calculations button. We're going to hit VTI. And we're going to trace the area under the curve starting here all the way down like this of one curve. And this is the high peak of systole and the uh, descending stepwise deceleration of diastole. We see here our VTI is close to 60 with a V max of 352 centimeters per second. But more importantly, our V mean is 229 centimeters per second in keeping with severe vasospasm. How can we confirm this and that this is not just hyperemia? We can actually do our Lindegard ratio. So what we do is actually switch to our linear probe and we'll look on the ipsilateral ICA side, so on the right ICA side of this patient. 
what we do is we look for the carotid flow as we can see here and then what we're going to be doing is again another pulse wave Doppler and then we trace again a VTI of this curve and what we notice is that our V mean here is 33 centimeters per second. So using the Vlindegaard ratio, we take our MCA flow divided by our RCA mean flow, which was 229 centimeters per second divided by 33 centimeters per second, and the ratio is about 7. And again, severe vasospasm is greater than 6, so already this patient has severe vasospasm based on this uh, Lindegaard ratio, as well as individual velocities of greater than 200 uh, centimeters per second. So the second case is a 52-year-old gentleman involved in a multi-trauma motor vehicle collision at slow speeds who presented with a traumatic brain injury and VSA arrest with prolonged downtime at the scene. Although it was queried as traumatic, there was also a question whether or not this was an aneurysm rupture leading to SAH because the patient was not involved in a high-speed uh, motor vehicle collision. He primarily had diffuse uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage with global anoxic injury, likely secondary to his VSA. As you can see here, the sulci are completely filled with subarachnoid blood and also at the basal cistern level as well. So we later presume this gentleman as a ruptured aneurysm with SAH anoxic brain injury. Our neurocritical care consultants gave a poor prognosis and eventually right before our eyes the patient went into a Cushing's response with high ICP of hypertension, bradycardia and we thought there might have been a herniation syndrome. The patient was too hemodynamically unstable to actually transfer down for a ancillary test of a CTA or a nuclear medicine brain scan and was in, uh, primarily because he was requiring increasing amounts of vasopressors of norepinephrine and vasopressin. Therefore, a bedside POCUS was sought after for a transcranial Doppler in keeping with a possible cerebral circulatory arrest and brain death in this patient. So Hassler et al. Uh, produced a paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery back in 1989 that says that if you insinate the MCA, you will see with decreasing cerebral perfusion pressure from increasing ICP and a ventral circulatory arrest, you will have these changes found primarily in the MCA. So at first, you'll still have your normal MCA systolic upstroke, which is sharp, and then pre preservation of the diastolic uh, deceleration step but over time as you can see the systolic uh, wave would stay the same but you will have eventual diastolic blunting and eventual loss of the diastolic flow in keeping with increased ICP as the dominant pressure that is occurring in the brain during diastole. Eventually if the uh, ICP is worse enough and it actually decreases cerebral perfusion pressure to the point where you actually have diastolic blood flow reversal um, during diastole because the ICP is so high and eventually you would get uh, low flows again with no diastolic blood flow and even circulatory arrest would be no blood flow at all in the MCA. So this patient received a transcranial Doppler trying to look for uh, the same things that we had mentioned before and as we can see here we can see a sharp systolic uh, upstroke but as we see here we actually have diastolic blunting in keeping with the fact that the patients on this area of the curve with decreased cere cerebral perfusion pressure and what's dominating right now during diastole is higher ICP so therefore instead of having that nice uh, deceleration diastolic flow we actually have blunting of that flow. Note the time is actually 1824 and if we look onwards so this is a real-time TCD image of a cerebral circuit arrest taken five minutes after the patient had a Cushing's response with high blood pressure as well as uh, bradycardia. And as we can see here, we're looking for MCA flow, and we do see it at times in red, but more importantly, we see at times uh, that the flow is actually blue, and that blue flow is actually in keeping with flow reversal uh, going away from the uh, probe uh, in keeping with diastolic flow reversal. So we see that here, as mentioned before, that uh, again, only five minutes later uh, at 1829, we see that our flows are systolic, still upstroked, but we don't have that nice stepwise uh, diastolic flow. And not only is it not uh, above the baseline anymore, but it's actually reversed and it's flipped below the baseline. As, as you can see, we've actually gone to a point where we're actually further along the circulatory arrest and the ICP is so high now that it's caused uh, diastolic flow reversal. So this was impending for cerebral circulatory arrest in keeping with brain death.
An ancillary test was later sought after when the patient was more hemodynamically stable, but it was in keeping with our previous findings on this TCD that the patient had uh, brain death. In conclusion, the transcranial Doppler is a good point-of-care ultrasound application, which is non-invasive, quick, and easily repeatable, performed at the bedside ultrasound through the transtemporal window with ultrasound looking at the MCA. Our neuro applications that we've taught you here are primarily for vasospasm post-subarachnoid hemorrhage and cerebral circulatory arrest. However, there's other applications and other indications available. On behalf of Dr. Arnfeld, Dr. Zarnett, and myself, thank you very much for joining us for this point-of-care ultrasound transcranial Doppler teaching. Thank you very much and have a nice day.